we've got. I best thing you to deliberately hurt somebody, and God knows you've well hurt me, ain't you? Well, not anymore, Den. I'm in charge now. I'll be honest with you. I love you to death, but you know, I don't like you very much anymore. So now I'm in charge, and you know it. My sins and for my sins and yours. Laying down the law there. We'll find out what happens tomorrow night. Well, it's a big night on ABC tonight. 8 o'clock, the first ever international final of the Krypton Factor gets underway as Chris Connolly from Australia teams up with New Zealand's own John Cargill to represent Australia against the two top-ranked British contenders. Don't miss this. ...to provide rehabilitation and deterrence. As we continue our special series on the jail system, it's clear those crucial objectives are not being met. When a prisoner finally wins release from the physical and emotional abuse of incarceration, you might think that the memory would be a powerful deterrent. In fact, six in every ten prisoners return, usually for a more serious crime. The trouble is, crime is about the only self-improvement course available to most inmates. And I'll be getting out for maximum security, no doubt, with $35. $35, no social skills, no work skills, no training skills, and people honestly believe that I'm going to be a productive member of society. What, my, what are my choices, what are my options? Live in a halfway house, live in a park, or rob the ANZ? The final part of tonight's program will look at the destructive cycle of crime. First, we're going to enter the gloomy world of the prison officer, and again, some of the language could offend. The long-term effects of jail on a prisoner are well documented. Not so the effects of a lengthy stretch as a prison officer. They too are doing time in a uniform. They're also shut away in dark, dank institutions. Like their charges, prison officers endure a low public image. And above all, they too must cope with the numbing boredom and ever-present threat of violence. Yet for all they have in common, there's a grim, implacable hostility between the keeper and the kept. between prison officers and prisoners is absolutely fundamental. No amount of psychologists and psychiatrists, no amount of prison reform will change if prison officers do not start uh, changing their views about their role and attempting to relate to prisoners in a humane, educative manner. At the moment, prison officers simply see themselves as security people, uh, who have to keep prisoners down and that I think basically stops any worthwhile prison reform. And there's no question that uh, we do have an image problem uh, but what to do about it is a very very difficult one as far as we're concerned because people have made up their minds quite clearly on a prison officer and I think it's pretty well black and white as far as they're concerned. I think Australians do have a hostile attitude towards law enforcement, people in general, be they prison officers or police officers, and I think it goes back to uh, the settlement of the country. Not without good reason, of course, that people were brutalised in those days, but I don't believe that, that the prison system is about brutalising people today. And I think certainly the role of the prison officers is very, very much misunderstood by the public generally. Officers are spat at. 
swore constantly prisoners are swearing at officers. Officers are told under no circumstances are they to swear at prisoners. Yet we have, uh, suffer from this problem from prisoners on a day-to-day -day basis. The situation that is here is that you're scumbag if you, do, if you don't do something for a prisoner and you're a weak scumbag if you do do something for a prisoner. Favours, like you phone up his remuneration, you cut red tape, you, it's, it's a favour. If they, they have to do something, they have to go on a request and it's, and it's long, it's drawn out, it's time consuming. You can take a shortcut, but that's a favour. You do the favour, you're weak. You don't do the favour, you're not liked at all. You know, you're scumbag. We do have an officer here, one in particular, who stands right out. He goes to the cells of a night time to count the heads, a head count they call it, which is to see the bodies in the cell. As he goes to each cell, instead of saying an inmate or a prisoner accounting, his, his saying is, maggot here, another maggot here, there's another maggot here. So he's got us all as maggots, not as prisoners, not as anything else. He set up his own system, whereas we are maggots. Most prison officers adopt the policy that if a prisoner is reasonable to him, he will be reasonable to the prisoner and he will attend to any requirements that he's entitled to. If a prisoner wants to be a troublemaker, wants to adopt an arrogant attitude, a threatening attitude, as many of them do, then we certainly will not go out of our way to help him. You can't trust a prison officer. And there, there are guys in prison who do trust prison officers and chat to them. Um, but they usually find out as soon as there's a riot that that same guy they were chatting to will come in with a baton and will really go berserk and let out all his aggression and all his pent up sort of psychological traumas that he's having at home. He'll take it out with, on you with the baton, you know. Maybe his, uh, his missus has just left him or something, you know, and he's, I've seen them, you know, I've been hit myself with the batons and they go overboard. You know, some of the prison officers, that's not all of them, you know, but some of them really go overboard. They really get carried away, you know, they have to be dragged off by the other prison officers from beating prisoners, otherwise they'd beat them to death. The role of a prison officer is unique to any other job. You're trying to sit on the lid of something. You've got all these people concentrated in, the, in an unnatural environment, prisoners, who have been convicted, some haven't been convicted, some are on remand, um, and your, your role is to try and keep the lid on it. The lid came off at Bathurst Jail in the summer of 1974. For the first time since white settlement, the secret world of prisons was blasted open. And the shockwave was felt in jail and out, all over the country. Sunday, February 3rd, 1974. Bathurst Jail, its anger, frustration and despair simmering for years, boils over. say is that the men who did that, if it's as bad as they say, are pretty desperate men. Now, there must be a reason why they got so desperate. 
And I reckon it's that prison that made them so desperate and the system which controls it. Eventually, in the early hours of this morning, the prisoners were subdued enough to be loaded aboard buses and prison wagons for the convoy to Long Bay. Why have you rioted? Why have you rioted? They have Did they? They shot us. They shot everything to us. There's two bad dozens of things in there. They're going to bash. No, we'll tell them all. They're going to they're gonna bash as soon as we get to Long Bay. They're going to do anything. I think what happened at Bathurst was a watershed in Australian penal history, and for the reason that the public, which had been getting snippets of information about what was going on in the prisons, the bashings, the allegations of the brutality at Grafton and so on, could no longer ignore this. Uh, they had to face up to the fact that they had institutions where people were brutalised, where officers just had no conception of the task they were really about, just drew out the worst in people and then shoved the lot back onto the community. The jail had been effectively destroyed. Its replacement would cost the taxpayer $10 million. And there was more. The riot put prison policies, prison conditions, prison perversions under a glare of publicity. Before the ashes of Bathurst jail were cold, the stories were spreading of oppression, injustice, brutality by guards towards prisoners. And not just at Bathurst. The stories were stronger than the official denials. The allegations were too widespread and too specific to ignore. A reluctant New South Wales government, cornered, delayed for two years before yielding to pressure and setting up a royal commission. It was quite apparent that in Bathurst and Grafton, a systematic campaign of bashings and violence was uh, inflicted on prisoners, uh, approved of by uh, prison officers and agreed to by certain sections of the administration. That came out for the first time. No longer could only prisoners be, be seen as being violent. Prison officers were systematically beating and in some cases torturing prisoners. That two-year inquiry, the Nagel Commission, was to be a milestone in Australian penal history. In sworn and indisputable evidence, jails like Bathurst and Grafton joined Norfolk Island and Port Arthur and brought up to date our brutal convict past. When I came in the prison van to Grafton Prison for the first time, we were let out of the prison van and walked through a gate in the, in the wall of the prison. And uh, we were told to stand on a line, a white line, <coughs> against the wall, and the gate was slammed shut. One of the officers approached me and said, what's your name? And I said, Max Warner. And he, he uh, bashed me and knocked me to the ground and said, when you talk to me, call me sir, in an aggressive, threatening manner. He then moved on to the next fellow who was standing next to me and addressed him and said, this, asked him the same question. And he said his name and answered, sir. And he was bashed and knocked to the ground. And he said, smart cunt, eh? After he'd uh, clouded him. So then the third bloke's turn came and uh, he said to him, what's your name? And he told him his name and said, sir. And then he said, uh, he didn't bash him to the ground immediately. He said, oh, and where are you from? And then the prisoner said uh, where he was from and said, sir, again. And then after he'd said that, he crashed him and uh, knocked him over too. And the bloke protested and said, what am I getting hit for? And uh, obviously was astounded that he uh, was clouded because he observed the other two, us two, <laughs> copping it. And he knew, knew that he'd done correctly. And then he's, uh, it was pointed out to him that there was a sign to, that says observe silence while standing on the line between the two white lines. And, uh, it's well above eye level and he hadn't noticed it and neither had I or the other person that was there. And, uh, that was why he got bashed. The first calling I got when I arrived at Grafton was um, one I didn't think I was going to survive. It seemed to go on forever. Because uh, on that one, when you arrive, you're stripped naked, completely naked, and then you're flogged. And um, I think that's the most 
frightening experience you can ever have. I mean, at least when you've got clothes on, you feel protected somewhat, you know, but when you're naked, it's, um, you don't feel like you can defend yourself. And uh, they don't stop. They go until you hit the ground, and there's no stopping until you have, you know. In Grafton Jail, you were bashed for having a button undone anywhere on your shirt or your pocket. It didn't matter where the button was. If it was undone by accident, you were bashed. If you had dirty shoes or they weren't as clean as the officer thought they should be, you got bashed for that. And they used uh, rubber battens, which had a lead sent up. And you have three or four officers used to flog you. You never flogged by one. It was always by three or four, and they used to flog you anything from five minutes to half hour. But uh, they did a lot of damage in that time, you know, and you used to get flogged from the shoulders down. They used to leave your face alone. They didn't want anyone marked up just in case someone ever came to the jail, which they never. But uh, they'd flog you with those, and they used the end of them. Uh, if you stayed on your feet while you were being flogged, they'd hit you in the bottom here of the back to force you hit the ground. If you get hit with the end of a baton like that, it'll deck you every time. You know, a lot of people got really bad backs from that. I got bashed in a yard once for being late to take a little tin of bread to the front gate to feed the birds out the front. Uh, and I wasn't late. I was definitely wasn't late. The officer said I was late. And I turned to correct him that I wasn't late and I got backhanded and smashed all over the yard in front of all the other inmates. Most people who've been there hate with a great intensity. It's about the only emotion we have left. Um, they can't understand that. And then we get outside, if you, the majority of people who've been to Grafton and come back in from more, far more violent offences than what they went to jail for. I just couldn't believe the way that those men acted towards towards us, even though we'd broken the law and um, did the wrong thing by society and ourselves, and it was our fault that we were in prison. Uh, the experience of the place was shocking. It was terrible. I, it's just something that I never forget. I was revolted by those revelations. I sensed at the time that most of my fellow citizens were equally moved and revolted by what they were hearing. I hoped that the experience was one of, well, here's a black stain on the, the social conscience, if you like, of the state of New South Wales, and probably the Australian prison system generally, and that this will become the basis for massive reform.